Okay, listen. I know I'm gonna lose some more subscribers for this because I did make a name for myself, such as it is, by dunking on Star Trek Discovery. And listen, it was fun. I had a good time. But what if I told you I was wrong and Star Trek Discovery is good, actually? Hi there, I'm Ren, and I like to talk about things with a particular focus on pop culture and politics. Today we are going to be discussing Star Trek Discovery, and I'm going to eat a big old bowl of my own words because I was totally wrong about it. There will be spoilers for individual episodes and the larger plot lines of Star Trek Discovery, so if you are invested and do not want spoilers, then I would suggest saving this video until you're caught up or, uh, you know, watch at your own risk. On my first viewing of season one of Star Trek Discovery, I thought that the plot was silly, the bridge crew felt flimsy and underdeveloped, and Captain Lorca was completely unlikable. Through no fault of Jason Isaacs, who gave a fantastic performance in the role. He really does bad guys so well. But the story was so dark and violent that a lot of the time, to me at least, it barely felt like Star Trek. And it was set up as a prequel series for what seemed like no discernible reason other than so that they could rely on existing Trek characters and canon for a built-in audience without having to gamble on something new. So I was definitely among the fans who felt like Star Trek Discovery was uninspired and I was really disappointed and I was not quiet about it. I made a ton of videos about it and now, looking back on those videos, eh. Although the Klingon War was an interesting premise, I didn't think it was well executed enough to justify Discovery's setting or the choice to do that instead of another war or threat from a new species in the future. The secret Klingon operative plot with Vok was too silly for me, even though it was based on existing Trek canon. And I also didn't like that it resulted with that barrier gaze plot with Stamets and Dr. Kolber. And they, in my opinion, really struggled to kind of retcon that in season two and the whole situation sort of drags the story down. And even though I know it was likely always their plan to bring Hugh back, I think that of the things that they spent time on, they spent way too much time undoing that mess and they should have undone it at the end of season one and taken care of it. I also didn't love Burnham's mutineer redemption arc initially. I felt like it was extra obstacles for the character without much purpose to the overall story besides making her into like a fish out of water to start with. But it was also reminiscent of Tom Paris's arc from convict to lieutenant in Voyager. The romance between Burnham and Ash Tyler felt really rushed and I didn't feel like they had much chemistry together. This is because Ash Tyler has all of the personality of a brick. I'm sorry. <laughs> there just weren't a lot of likable or developed side characters, and certainly not many memorable ones. While I loved Tilly, Saru, and Stamets, we didn't really get to spend much time with the rest of the bridge crew, and it did leave the cast feeling a little bit thin. And then there's the Mirror Universe plot that kicks off towards the end of Season 1. The foreshadowing was there to an extent with stuff going on with the mirrors and Lorca being unusually dark and morally ambiguous for a Starfleet captain, so it's not like they didn't build it up. Then Mirror Giorgio kills Lorca and Burnham brings her back to the Prime Universe in the process. The Klingon War ends a little anticlimactically and Laurel becomes the leader of the Klingon Empire and Burnham is pardoned and the crew's given medals. So. My initial impression of season one was that it wasn't great. I felt like there was a lot more to dislike about it than there was to like about it. I do want to credit myself with saying I've always been pretty consistent about saying that if you do like Discovery, and if you liked Discovery from the first moment that you saw it and you just love this show, you're not wrong. You're not a bad Star Trek fan. You clearly just enjoy different things about it than I did or picked up on things that I didn't notice until my second viewing. And that's fine. But after finishing season three, because I watched through this whole series hoping that it would get better, hoping that I would like it eventually. Because I want to like new Star Trek. I like enjoying things. I don't dislike things for the purpose of disliking them. Like, that's not fun for me. I don't really revel in that kind of negativity. Like, there are things that I can hate watch or whatever, 
but in terms of something like Star Trek, I want it to be good. I'm invested in this franchise. I want to enjoy it. You know, this isn't the room. <laughs> so, I caught up and I finished season three and I found myself actually kind of wanting more Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> so I decided to start again from episode one and I am really, really glad that I did. Upon rewatch, there were some stronger things that stuck out to me that I was maybe too overwhelmed by the darker tone to really appreciate on first viewing. While the spore drive technology is anachronistic, I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's so cool. As a person who really loves mushrooms and fungi and mycology and finds them absolutely fascinating, the spore drive and exploring things related to it presented some opportunities for beautiful and absolutely magical storytelling. The tardigrade plot introduced in The Butcher Cares Not for the Lamb's Cry, for example, felt very Star Trek to me. Every Trek series pretty much has had episodes that center around whether it's morally acceptable to hurt or exploit another creature, even if it's for your own survival. And both the buildup and conclusion to that story really did fit the tone of the Trek that I recognized from my childhood, so I was really pleased with that. Stamets and his frustration with being forced to make war instead of science is really compelling. His awe and wonder at the mycelial network is infectious, and I enjoyed almost every scene that he was in. Anthony Rapp has a lot of range, and I really liked his performance from the start. His character ends up getting a lot of development, even just through season one, where he goes from being kind of bristly and contemptuous to being a little bit more open. And he makes more friends and deepens those relationships as the season goes on. A few episodes in season one really stood out to me. Choose Your Pain is a classic Star Trek Escape from Capture episode, and Lorca's actually really fun in this one. And I actually do enjoy the chemistry between him and Ash Tyler in that episode. We also get acquainted with Harry Mudd, who is great in this episode and in Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad, which is everyone's favorite episode of season one of Star Trek Discovery as far as I've heard. Can't blame them, it's mine too. And in that one we get like a time travel plot that's really on par with some of the best ones in TNG, DS9, and Voyager. There's just a really good comedy element to it that's really fun, and I enjoyed that a lot. The Wolf Inside had the flavor of Trek optimism even in the darkness of the Terran Empire, with the alliance of species united to fight the Empire led by Mirror Vok. The conclusion of the Mirror storyline was fast-paced and it did have some really impressive action scenes that were pretty cool to look at. The conclusion to the Klingon War to me did feel bumpier, but I have to admit on a second watch, I was a lot more invested in the Klingon politics than I expected to be, and in Lorel's storyline in particular. I also liked Burnham's solution to avoid the loss of life and find a peaceful way to conclude the war that did feel very Star Trek to me. I really enjoyed Saru, and the introduction of the Kelpian species is one of the strongest additions, in my opinion. His story felt extremely rooted in the magic of older Trek series whenever it became the focal point. In C.V. Packham Parabellum, we see Saru feel peaceful and unafraid for the first time, and it was a classic alien-influenced personality shift episode like we've seen in almost every Trek series. But the meditation on what it's like to live in fear really impacted me, especially rewatching it as a chronically ill person during a pandemic that definitely hits different the second time around. Doug Jones is phenomenal, and he really brings so much grace and personality to Saru, and the way he emotes through those prosthetics is really impressive considering how heavy that makeup is. Like, I've done and worn pretty heavy prosthetic makeup before, and it can be really difficult to do basic things like talking or eating with some costumes, and his looks like it involves a lot of like very heavy and complicated pieces, and it's just very impressive. It must be a lot to wear, and he does an amazing job with it. Overall, while season one of Discovery still isn't my favorite first season of Trek, I did find a lot more to like about it than I expected to, and I had a lot more fun watching it the second time around. I definitely have more of an understanding now of why so many people were huge fans from the start. For me, I think it did improve kind of knowing where they were going with some of the characters and storylines 
I do wish that Discovery had spent a little bit less time on the war storyline and a bit more time building up the characters and their relationships, but honestly, rewatching season one, I had a good time, and the optimism and warmth and love that I initially thought was missing from this new series was still there. It just came out in different places in different ways than I expected it to. As a first season of Trek goes, it definitely was not the worst. While I wish we got more characterization, the characters we actually got to know were mostly really memorable. And although some people claim the show focused exclusively on Michael, that's really not true. Lorca had a weird fixation on her, but other characters still had a lot to do. Stamets is absolutely essential to both the plot and the character ensemble. Saru comes up with creative answers and solutions to problems a lot, and he's also kind of a foil to Michael where they have a lot of disagreements and sometimes Michael's in the wrong. Tilly is shown excelling all the time, and her relationship with Michael and pretty much anyone else she comes in contact with is incredibly endearing and sweet. She's just such a tender, awkward little person and I adore her. She's a ray of pure sunshine. And also, I actually really like Michael. Like, initially, I think I had some reservations about some of the choices that they made with her character, but I love Sonequa Martin-Green, and her acting chops really shine in this role. Michael is smart and brave and complex, but she's written with this intense undercurrent of vulnerability that Martin-Green brings to the surface so beautifully. Michael's mutiny plot, more than anything, is to show us that there are consequences for mistakes, and also that a lot of the time, the person responsible for those mistakes punishes themselves more than anyone else ever can. Even after she's released from prison, she is still punishing herself. She has the casualties that she's responsible to memorized to the number. Michael has so many layers of trauma that we get to see her work through, and she grows so much even in just the first season as we get to know her. So at least for me, it's kind of impossible not to like her. The relationship between Sarek and Michael is also really strong. I definitely have to hand that to the performances, because on one hand, I really wish the Spock family storyline maybe wasn't involved, or was involved to a lesser degree. But ultimately, I don't dislike it in terms of the actual execution. It's more that there was only so much time in season one and I wish we had maybe spent some more time on some of the other stuff I liked. Season one's still pretty uneven in my opinion. The larger story pieces like the Klingon War and the Mirror Universe and the romantic subplot all felt rushed. But the moments where it's good, even right out of the gate, Discovery is so good. At the start of season two, the show is a little too focused on Michael and the other few characters we got to know in season one, and still hasn't really built up enough of the world around them. It's particularly noticeable in a scene where Captain Pike has everyone on the bridge crew introduce themselves, and there are several characters that I can still barely remember the name of on the main bridge crew. Michael Burnham. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in my house? I didn't love the Spock plot, and I felt like it wasn't really necessary for the Red Angel storyline. It seemed like they wanted to have Spock just to have more ties to existing Trek canon. That said, there was some really good acting chemistry between Michael and Spock, and a lot of moments with real emotional weight. And a lot of the scenes on Vulcan were really pretty to look at, and I know that that is a very shallow reason to enjoy something, but I'm just a sucker for aesthetics. I don't know what to say. I liked that following the signals caused more episodic adventures with loosely tying them to the main plot. And I think season two stumbled the most when it tried to be more serialized and was really successful when it was a little bit more episodic. Also, what's with all the sexy young Vulcans and Romulans with beards that we're now seeing in both Discovery and Picard? What's up with that? What's up with that? I just want to know, because they've mostly been clean shaven before, so like... What's the deal? What's the dealio? Sorry, there was an interruption. I think the worst parts of season two were the convoluted resolution to the Red Angel plot. I appreciated that Michael wasn't the special and that it was her mother, but it did feel a little bit improbable and silly. On the other hand, it did also feel classically Star Trek. We've had all kinds of plots with secret family members and people coming back from the dead. 
So I think people really do forget just how hammy and silly Star Trek can get. <coughs> Tasha Yar. I was preemptively soured on the evil AI storyline, having finished season one of Picard before season two of Discovery. But by the end of season two, I was starting to feel a lot more familiar with the bridge crew. I finally knew some more of their names and how they relate to each other. In season two, I also definitely had some favorite episodes. New Eden was really interesting and raised some very classic Trek moral questions around the Prime Directive, or, you know, at this point in Trek history, General Order 1. And Obel for Sharon and Saints of Imperfection give us a wonderful story with Tilly, Stamets, and a species known as the Jashep. This is also where they get Colbert back, but honestly, I really wish they just hadn't killed him in the first place. But the wonder and mystery surrounding May and the reveal of their species and the alien species using an unusual means of communication to get the Federation to help them, that is classic Trek through and through. It's immediately followed with The Sound of Thunder, a fantastic episode that reveals a lot more about Kaminar and the Kelpians and their culture. It turns out that the Kelpians were not actually the prey species on their planet. Rather, the Ba'ul, the technologically superior species that controls the planet, is the prey species. And they are attempting to eliminate Kelpians, the predatory species, before they go through something called the Vaharai, a stage of maturity that makes them much more dangerous and much less afraid. The Ba'ul lied to the Kelpians and claimed it was the natural end of their life cycle, so they've basically been euthanizing Kelpians before they go through the process completely and recover their strength. The Kelpians lived in fear, not knowing that the Ba'ul were actually so much weaker than they were. I really enjoyed this episode, and I loved the growth and development for Saru. I loved the addition of his sister, Serana. Her wonder at space travel and at discovery and her love for Saru were really good additions that brightened up the story and made the world feel a little bit more lived in. And seeing Kaminar was really interesting. The addition of Jet Reno after her rescue in Brother is lovely. I absolutely adore Tig Notaro, although I do feel like she's a little bit underutilized. What we do get to see of her is great, and the back and forth with Stamets is always really fun. Also, I really love that engineering is now just full of a bunch of nerdy gays. It just makes me happy. Her introduction is being trapped on a defunct ship towards the end of the war because she wanted to stay and keep a bunch of injured crewmen who weren't stable enough to move alive. This character intro was super effective shorthand to show us how dedicated she is to Starfleet values and just what a good person she is. And I think she injects even more life into the engineering duo of Stamets and Tilly, and I hope we get more episodes that focus on her in future seasons because, again, she's great. I just want her to have more screen time. Learning more about Arium in Project Daedalus was still a highlight of the season, even though I am mad about how they chose to end her story. <laughs> I really like that we got a little bit more focus on her because she got so little screen time prior to that that she really just felt like a cool set piece more than a, an actual character. Seeing her method of saving her memories was a fascinating story concept and I think it could have made for a really cool plot device in future episodes if they had bothered to keep her around. <laughs> I'm sad. I wish we had gotten to spend more time with the character sooner. But the more that I talk about Discovery, the more that I realize that my complaints are that I just want more of it. More time to get to know these characters and the world they inhabit. I think Arium was a major missed opportunity in that her character design, disabled status, and the mechanics of her character and story all had a lot of potential to be super rich and interesting additions to the story. But I also understand that part of it was due to the initial actress they cast having an allergic reaction to the prosthetics. I just don't understand why we couldn't keep the recast Arium as well as the new crewman and just see more of her. It seemed like a shame to remove her character from the equation after so little time with her. And even though it did pack like some emotional punch, it still felt kind of unearned. So I didn't love the resolution of season two other than that it projected the characters into the future away from the shackles of existing canon. And even on rewatch, the last few episodes do feel like a blur of action and improbable contrivances. However, despite not having a great finale, I have to admit I liked more of the episodes than I didn't. 
and there were a lot of individual scenes that I really liked. Overall, I enjoyed more of Star Trek Discovery than I was expecting to. I found myself a little bit sad when I ran out of episodes and had to wait for season three, like some kind of animal. I found myself revisiting the episodes that I liked and I started to realize I was actually getting pretty invested in the story. But for some reason, I was still a little bit reluctant to get on board and call myself a fan. Then season three rolled around. By season three, they resolved my gripe about sticking Discovery in the past by catapulting them into the distant future in a really interesting and ultimately very optimistic storyline about finding and repairing the remains of the Federation after the burn, an explosion that destroys a lot of the active warp cores within a certain radius and rendered much of the quadrants dilithium inert. One of the things that frustrated me most about modern Trek prequels is how anachronistic they felt in terms of like all of the technology and the slick designs and it just doesn't quite feel like it fits as a prequel. And also, I didn't really like how existing canon felt more like a cage trapping the writers than a jumping off point for them to tell new stories. By shifting Discovery so far in the future, they don't really have to worry about whether things are consistent with fan expectations of Trek or previous canon. This season felt fresh and new, but at the same time, it also felt more like classic Trek than either of the previous seasons. Uncovering the mystery of the burn and exploring the distant future of the Federation while having Discovery run to various places because they're the only ship that can fast travel was not only a cool storyline, but it lent to fun episodic stories and we get to visit a lot of different species and planets to run errands for the Federation. We got some lovable recurring characters and to explore the distant future where things aren't as easy for the Federation without going quite as dark as they did in season one. In some ways, it almost feels like it's remixing the premise of Voyager, people cut off from their resources trying to get home and survive unfamiliar and harsh conditions, but even when they get home, there's still so much work to do. I love the trans representation with the addition of Adira and Grey. The casting of trans actors and the care with which some parts of the story are handled does really warm my heart. The episodes with Adira adapting to their symbiont towards the start of the season are really compelling, and I also adore the chemistry between them and Grey, although I do dislike that they buried our gaze twice. Like, it just really bothers me that of the two queer couples we see, both of them have been separated by death, even though they're obviously going to get Grey back, just like they got Hugh back. I just, it feels off to me that the writers chose these storylines specifically for the queer characters. Like, one of the two, it would have been kind of like, huh? But both of them, like, both couples? What the hell, Paramount? And my fury is about Discovery burying my gaze twice and then desperately trying to retcon it. Yes. But at least they have gaze. And despite using that awful barrier gaze trope, as characters, they do still get a good amount of screen time and development and it's not the end point in their stories. There's more to them than tragedy. I really like Adira in particular. They remind me of so many nerdy queer scientists in my life, and I love their relationship with Grey. I love Stamets and Kolber, now that they're back together. I like that they spent a lot more time on Hugh in season three, developing him, because he was pretty undeveloped when they killed him in season one. I wish his story wasn't quite so focused on recovering from the trauma of dying and being brought back to life. But what can you do? The relationship with Stamets and Adira does feel a little bit rushed to me, but I also just really like the idea of an elder gay sort of like adopting a younger gay, taking them under their wing and creating a chosen family for them. And the characters do work really well together when they interact. I just wish we spent more time on it so some of the moments that are like more tense felt more earned. So there are still some hiccups. Discovery isn't perfect. Some of the writing's still a little bit overwrought. And while there's more side characters to love, Discovery has a troubling habit of developing side characters only to kill them off or otherwise rid the series of them swiftly afterwards, which limits some of the familiar faces we see. Like, for example, we got to know Nan a little better towards the end of season two both before and after the events of Project Daedalus. And she was the one who actually ejected Arium out the airlock because Burnham totally choked in that moment. They have a really nice moment together after Arium's funeral. And then we get an episode focused on her in Die Trying. 
in which Nan takes over the watch of a Barzan who has lost his family after an accident with radiation aboard the Federation's Seed Vault ship. We get some wonderful emotional moments where Nan hears her language and sees her people for the first time in years. And it was just really sad that we finally got to know her a little bit better. And then she immediately decided to leave Discovery. And just like that, another promising character is gone. Like, what the heck? But overall, I'd be lying if I said that season three of Disco wasn't good. Like, I think there's room for improvement. But anyone acting like this show has nothing going for it, or that it's somehow worse than any other Trek we've seen before, has been seen Trek through rose-colored glasses. Personally, I don't like to hate things just for the sake of hating them. I'm actually really pleased that Star Trek Discovery found its footing. I always really hoped that it would get better as the series went on. Star Trek is notorious for having kind of, you know, rough starts to new series. Like season one of TNG is so bad, it is borderline unwatchable. Like I'm genuinely kind of surprised it got renewed for additional seasons. I could never get through season one of Enterprise. And while I personally enjoyed season one of DS9, most people find it boring and don't, don't enjoy its meandering pace. The original series obviously has a first season that is a product of its time. Like, it's, it's good because it's classic, but in terms of modern television, it does not hold up. So I'd place season one of Discovery above season one of TNG, but below DS9. But at this point, Discovery has really come into its own. Some of its episodes are on par with the best of what we see from TNG, Voyager, and DS9. And sure, it still has corny moments and stumbling blocks, but like, may I remind you that Sub Rosa, the Beverly Ghost episode, yes, you know the one I'm talking about, that was in season seven of TNG. I think a lot of people only remember the highlights and forget just how many bad and silly episodes there were. In season three, we finally get to see enough of Awoshiku and Detmer that I actually remember their names. Although, aside from Saru and Tilly, I still don't remember much of the bridge crew. Reese? I feel like I know which one Reese is. Maybe. We get to see a little bit more of Lieutenant Reno, but let's be real, it will never be enough. And we get a lot of fun new characters in season three, including several recurring characters and nice self-contained storylines. I think my favorite recurring character that we get in season three of Star Trek Discovery is probably Book. I love him. He's just a sweet outlaw man who loves animals and has magic powers that allow him to talk to them. And his species is really cool, and his chemistry with Michael is so much better than her chemistry with Ash Tyler. I really like them together both as friends, and when they finally kiss, finally. Yeah, so Book was an excellent addition, and I really enjoy him. If there's anywhere Discovery's still weakest, it's mostly on larger plot lines, which range from silly to so convoluted that they're actually a little bit hard to explain. One thing I will add, though, is that a lot of previous Trek series did have pretty static characters. Like, the Picard from Season 1 of TNG is really not that different from the Picard we meet in Season 7. Riker doesn't change much, Beverly's almost totally static, Tori gets, like, a little development with her command promotion, and Data gets the most development with his quest to become human. But, you know, the characters just really don't change a lot. Geordi doesn't experience a lot of growth. This is also true of Voyager. Janeway doesn't change a ton between season one and season seven. Harry Kim doesn't change much. Chakotay doesn't change much. The ones who get any development at all are Seven, Balana, Tom, and the Doctor. Oh, and Kess. I actually will defend Kess's arc because it's pretty interesting and I think that they kind of did her dirty. DS9 is probably the series with the most character growth because the story is written in a way that forces the characters to grow and adapt. And I think Discovery is most similar in that way. The settings in all three seasons are extreme. They push the characters and the premise to their limits. The Michael we meet at the start of season one is not the Michael we know by the end. Tilly, Saru, Stamets, even Lorca all have arcs in season one that progress their characters. And in season two, we see more growth from them. We see growth from Mira Georgiou through her love for Michael. And I think the characters in Discovery actually have a lot more growth than we really give them credit for to the point where I'd say it and DS9 have the best character growth of any Trek series. I think 
I realized Discovery really got me in the finale of season three, in which it's a two-parter where Discovery gets hijacked by the leader of the Emerald Chain, a capitalist Orion gang, basically. If you've watched this channel for a while, you'll know that one of my litmus tests for how much I care about a Star Trek show is how much I am bothered when the ship is in peril. Like in TNG or Voyager in particular, I was always really bothered in episodes where the ship blows up. I just don't like it. It makes me like a little bit stressed out because the ship almost feels like a second home, right? Like it's a familiar safe place for my characters. And so I don't like seeing it be damaged or destroyed. But in Discovery season one and two, I really didn't care that much about the ship. Like, I didn't mind seeing it blow up over and over again in Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. It just didn't bug me. Like, I kind of had an affection for some of the characters, but I was so frustrated with the writing that I just was not invested. Along the way, though, that changed. I'm invested now. I don't like seeing Discovery hijacked, and I was excited and relieved when they escaped. Star Trek Discovery has brought me to tears more than a few times between season two and the end of season three. And on rewatch, even in season one, there were a couple times I got misty. Also, the explanation for the burn, which was essentially a little boy's grief being projected through a scientific anomaly and impacting the world around him, reminded me a bit of The Empty Child, a classic episode of Doctor Who with the Ninth Doctor, in terms of the feelings of a child being externalized in such a big way. Sukal was a little bit lackluster for me, but his story was so Star Trek that it still made me feel good and I still definitely cried. Like it was bad, it was very silly, but it was Star Trek bad, if that makes sense. Like when I explain the plot out loud, it sounds a bit absurd, but there are so many Trek storylines like that that I didn't really mind. And I'm actually a lot more disappointed so far with Star Trek Picard, and I don't have as much hope for season two as I do for Discovery season four. I don't think it's gotten nearly as much hate, and I don't understand why not. And actually, I do have some theories, because it really was so bad. I am officially a fan of Star Trek Discovery. I am so excited for season four. And personally, I'm relieved at this point that my biggest complaint is that I just want more. I want to see more of the Discovery crew and this future Federation. I want them to streamline the writing more so we have more time for the characters to breathe and just live their lives and less in the service of moving the larger plot forward. I actually think an episode like Data's Day, where the conflict is more lightly interpersonal, but the episode mostly just focuses on a day in the life of the crew when there isn't some emergency or catastrophe, would go a long way to building a bit more familiarity with Discovery and her crew. Like maybe we follow Tilly around for a day, or maybe it's a random bridge crewman like Reese who we really don't normally see very much of. I really enjoyed Lower Decks, and I'll make a video about that soon too. But I was starting to worry that the only good modern Star Trek we were going to get was gonna be a cartoon and a Seth MacFarlane parody series. So I'm really glad that Discovery seems to be figuring out what Star Trek fans actually want. Also, while this did not play a role in my evaluation of the show in terms of its quality, I am glad to no longer be in the same camp as a lot of people who seem to take issue with Discovery for the wrong reasons. I'm glad a sci-fi series of this caliber has a black female lead and that a show with this kind of front and center queer representation is doing so well. Especially because despite being deliberate with its representation, as Star Trek has always been, Discovery actually feels a lot more sci-fi focused and less explicitly focused on political allegory than a lot of Trek series have been. It's really interesting to me how some Star Trek fans politicize the identities of these characters when the actual political commentary in the series is much less explicit and a lot of the stories are more action-based. Not that Discovery doesn't have its political moments or its smart concepts, they just tend to be more ephemeral and they tend to be more implicit than the commentary that we've seen in older Trek series. The idea that Discovery is somehow ham-fisted in its political view and representation choices when compared to other Star Trek series is laughable. Like, come on. Disco's narratives focus more on overcoming personal trauma, struggles with identity, themes of optimism, trust, love, resilience, compassion, curiosity, redemption. 
we haven't really had a lot of direct political allegory or in-your-face moralizing like previous Trek series. Star Trek has historically used extremely thinly veiled allegory for the content of many of its stories to varying degrees of success. For example, in TNG we get the most explicit LGBT representation from them in The Outcast, in which a genderless species known as the Janai is subject to conversion therapy if they identify as one gender or the other. A clear allegory for prejudice against LGBTQ people and conversion therapy. It's also present with the Trill a little bit in The Host in TNG and more explicitly in DS9 with Jadzia Dax. And there's both explicit and allegorical criticism of imperialism and colonialism in the original series TNG and Voyager. And in DS9, with varying degrees of success, there's also explicit and implicit criticism of racism. There's criticism of poverty, homelessness, capitalism, forced scarcity. They even try their hand at representing indigenous people, again, with varying degrees of success. Using Jamak Highwater as a consult on Voyager for Chakotay, years after indigenous people sounded the alarm on him was uh, a choice. Even disability and ableism are directly addressed, although once more with varying levels of efficacy. The idea that Discovery is making Star Trek more political when the original series aired in the 60s, during the Cold War and the Civil Rights era, and in the aftermath of World War II, and featured a black woman, a Japanese man, and a Russian on the bridge crew working together is goofy. Like, this is so political, come on. This is literally politicized representation. Star Trek was always intentional about inclusion and representation. In fact, there were multiple attempts to make it more inclusive that were basically just stymied by producers or the studio. It was never an accident. What has changed is how some fans have reacted to it, but actually not really, because people were still big mad about these things back then too. Star Trek has always been rich with themes of humanism, equity, respect for other cultures and their beliefs. And in opposition of cultural superiority, there are numerous episodes that explicitly have captains wrestle with the question of whether they have the right to intervene at all. That the Federation knows best is not a given and is something that is frequently challenged in the text. If you've missed the politics of Star Trek up to this point, you have missed most of the content of the show. This has not been the subtext, but again, it is the text. Honestly, I wish Star Trek Discovery would actually get more political and have more episodic political allegories that are more explicit, rather than weaving so much implicitly into the larger narrative. But that's a nitpick. I still think Discovery is doing more and more right, and I can't wait to see more of it. This video took me so long to make because I kept coming back to Discovery and seeing more and more to like about it. I'm sure I still missed a lot. It's okay if Discovery still isn't for you. I am not a fan of Enterprise or Picard so far. Not every Trek series is going to appeal to every Trek fan, but I'm tired of people acting like there's nothing good about Star Trek Discovery or that people who like it aren't real Trek fans or don't have good reasons for enjoying it. I think it has a lot going for it and sometimes it is truly sublime. So tell me, what is your favorite episode of Star Trek Discovery? That is all I have for you for now. I am trying really hard to get back into the swing of making content, but life has been very busy surviving a pandemic while being chronically ill and doing work in school and everything else has been taking up a lot of energy. So thank you for being patient with me. If you wanna see more of me, you can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. I am more active on TikTok since it's such a short form uh, means of creating content. I also have a second channel, Renata, where I post more personal and political content. Although so far I only have one video up, but check it out if you are not sick of me yet. So thank you for watching, see you next time. And again, sorry about how long it's been between videos. I kind of unexpectedly had to move and it was a whole thing, but I am settled now and will try to get back into posting with a little bit more regularity. I know I've said that before though, so. We'll see. And happy Star Trek Day, everyone. I actually didn't realize till I was editing. <laughs>